to most people, a woman with a nickname like the Acid Lady probably sounds like the life of any 70s era party. But to her unfortunate husband, however, Larissa Schuster's particular brand of acid served a much darker purpose. I'm Amy, and this is True Crime Recaps. This is where you're going to get all the crime in half the time. Now, if that sounds good to you, it would mean a lot to us if you gave this a like and hit subscribe and the bell so you never miss a recap. And with that, let's start at the beginning, or rather, the end. Tim Schuster's body, or what was left of it, at least, was found inside a storage unit in Fresno, California in July 2003. He was floating in a 55-gallon drum of hydrochloric acid. It had eaten away at his remains, but not completely. Much of the lower half of his body was still there. Tissue samples showed high levels of chloroform, which easily could have been fatal on its own, but it was impossible to determine if he was still alive when he was placed in the acid. Who could have done such a horrific thing to him? Who else? The person who used to love him his ex-wife, Larissa. Larissa and Tim met at a nursing home where she was working her way through a major in biochemistry at the University of Missouri. He was a nursing student, and despite their drastically different personalities, they seemed like a pretty good match. They got married in 1982, and three years later, they had a daughter they named Kristen, followed by a son in 1990, Tyler. In 1989, the family moved to Fresno, and Larissa found a job at an agricultural research lab. Eventually, she opened a lab of her own, which grew into a multi-million dollar chemical research facility. By 2000, they were able to move into a much nicer house in Clovis, California. In just a year's time, she was making twice what Tim made in a year working at St. Ignace Hospital. Larissa worked long hours, and Tim seemed happy to step into the role of caring for their children. He was described as a passive man who rarely argued against his wife's decisions and was usually content to cater to her often impossible standards, but their marriage was far from blissful. As her business grew more successful over the next couple of years, the family ties were coming apart. Now, she was a demanding, domineering woman, and as their daughter Kristen became a teenager, their relationship grew toxic. It takes a patient, loving mom to deal with a rebellious teenage girl, and Larissa, not that kind of mom. As their fights got more and more intense and became more frequent, Larissa reached her breaking point. Despite Tim's protests, she eventually sent Kristen back to Missouri to live with her grandparents. After 21 years of marriage, it seemed like her husband's agreeable nature had shifted, and Larissa was not pleased with his newfound spine. Although their personalities appeared to be on the opposite sides of the spectrum, friends and family noted that they seemed to complement one another well in the marriage, almost like a yin and yang sort of relationship. So when Larissa filed for divorce in February of 2002, however, it was apparent that that yin and yang thing was long gone. They lived together in the family home for several months after filing, but slept in separate rooms. Around this time, they started fighting over custody of their young son, and Larissa's caustic hatred began to consume her. In her mind, everything they shared during the marriage, the house, the business, even their 12-year-old son, belonged to her and her alone. She was a woman that was used to getting her way, and the fact that Tim was no longer willing to comply sent her into a seething rage that couldn't be concealed or controlled. Soon, she was telling anybody that would listen all about her burning desire to see her estranged husband dead. Friends, co-workers, even her nail technician would later tell investigators that she often launched into vulgar rants where she'd say things like, you don't understand, I could do it and get away with it. Apparently, everyone thought she was joking. Well, she wasn't. It was only later they realized that the only part of her anti-Tim campaign worth laughing about was the fact that she truly believed that she could pull the wool over the sharp eyes of a suspicious detective. In July of 2002, Larissa left to visit her family in Missouri. Now, while she was gone, Tim packed up whatever items in the house that he believed were rightfully his, and he moved into a condo of his own. 
When she came back to discover those possessions were missing, she lost her mind. As her murderous rage escalated to new heights, she began leaving Tim a series of deeply unhinged voicemails. In these messages, she continually alternated between demanding the return of her property and screaming the kind of profanity that George Carlin himself would have considered way out of line. But no matter how many voicemails Larissa left or how viciously she attacked him over the phone, Tim wasn't backing down. Once she realized her current intimidation tactics weren't working, she decided it was time to up the ante and find a little extra muscle. In this case, that extra muscle came from one of her lab assistants, a man by the name of James Fagone. By August 8th, 2002, she was ready to set her plan into motion, but certain preparations needed to be made first. She told another lab employee named Leslie Fachera she needed a place to stash some things she didn't want Tim to have. She asked her to rent a storage unit. Leslie complied with the request, it's her boss after all, and she rented the unit using her own name, and then she gave Larissa the access code. Now, two days later, Tim returned from a trip to find that his condo had been ransacked and robbed. It wasn't hard to figure out who was responsible either, since most of the items that were missing happened to be the things Larissa was demanding back, but she took something extra on her way out something that nobody but a vengeful ex-wife would even think to look for. The court records and reports that Tim was using to try to win custody of their son. To be fair, though, Larissa wasn't exactly denying her involvement. She told multiple people that she and James had broken into the residence. It was clear she took great pleasure trashing the place. According to Terry Lopez, Larissa's longtime nail tech, she admitted to going back several times just to sit in a chair and admire her handiwork. She claimed the feeling of being there amidst the destruction that she caused was better than sex. Clearly unnerved by this ever-escalating behavior, Tim purchased a handgun and he got a concealed carry license. He moved to another house in Clovis and he made sure to equip that with safety features like security alarms and motion sensors. Unfortunately, it would not be enough. Because by this point, Larissa was actively looking for someone to do more than just trash the place. She vowed to do anything and everything to keep Tim from getting their child, the business, or any other assets that they shared during the marriage. A plan A, intimidating him into compliance, hadn't worked. It was time for plan B. On April 30th, 2003, Larissa Schuster bought a blue 55-gallon barrel and had it sent to her lab. It wasn't the type of barrel the lab normally used, but she waved off any curious questions from her coworkers by explaining that it was for yard clippings. So, what? She even asked one employee if he thought a body could fit in it, but nobody suspected its true purpose. On several occasions, she made other remarks to this particular employee about her desire to murder her ex-husband and how she believed she could get away with it. Like everyone else, he took these comments as nothing more than jokes from a woman with a dark sense of humor in the middle of a messy divorce. Even when she outright asked this same employee if he knew anyone that would beat Tim up for her or maybe even kill him, he just shrugged it off. But then, a few months later, Tim Schuster went missing. On July 9th, the last day he was seen alive, Tim had just learned that he was being let go from his job at St. Agnes Hospital. He had dinner with some close friends that night and left their house sometime around 10 p.m. They had plans to meet up the next morning, and he was expected at the hospital for an exit interview later on that day, but he never showed up for either appointment. When he never turned up, a friend of his decided to swing by his house. Tim never answered the door, even though his truck could be seen in the garage. So sensing that something was off, his friend called the police and requested a wellness check. The officers did a quick search and they found nothing wrong, even though Tim himself was nowhere to be found. Despite the lack of any signs of struggle or forced injury, his friends were getting increasingly alarmed. Tim just wasn't the type to miss important meetings. And on top of that, the police discovered his cell phone on the dresser, and he definitely wasn't the type to go anywhere without it. He always had his phone on him so his kids could call in an emergency. So what could possibly 
make him leave it behind. Even with their concerns for his well-being mounting, the police said that they would need to wait at least 24 hours before they could file a missing persons report. Meanwhile, Larissa went to work that same morning with an injured shoulder, which she claimed resulted from a particularly strenuous workout earlier in the week. At some point, an employee noticed that the blue barrel had disappeared and there was a bottle of chloroform sitting on top of a cabinet, which wasn't suspicious at all. Now, after her shift, she stopped for her weekly nail appointment. Tim failed to pick their son up for his scheduled visit, but she didn't seem bothered by his absence. In fact, she told her manicurist that it felt like things were finally working out in her favor. Now, the next morning was July 11th and Tim was still missing. His friends followed through with filing that missing persons report, but murder wasn't really their chief concern. He just lost his job, after all, and he was dealing with his nasty divorce on top of it. So who wouldn't be tempted to skip town for a few days to get a break? But they couldn't ignore this nagging feeling that something far darker may have happened to him. What if it was all just too much and he took his own life? It was no secret that he had a gun, so the idea that he might have turned it on himself wasn't too far outside the realm of possibility. Now, this time, detectives were sent to Tim's house to look for clues. During their search, they discovered the gun was there. It was wedged between the cushions of a chair. It wasn't enough to rule out suicide on its own, but it now seemed like an unlikely outcome. Then they came across Larissa's voicemails. Even though the detectives were aware of the ugly divorce battle, the pure hatred that spewed from the recordings was shocking. In some of these messages, she threatened to have his nursing license revoked. In others, she denigrated his masculinity in the most vulgar ways imaginable, and she openly wished for him to suffer in the depths of hell. Upon further inspection of Tim's phone, they uncovered records of a call from Larissa that took place at around 2 a.m. on July 10th. Naturally, the investigators found this call to be incredibly suspicious. When the police had spoken to her earlier that afternoon, she told them that she hadn't heard from him at all. Yet there was clear evidence to the contrary. So what could she possibly be trying to hide? There was only one way to find out. Now, later that evening, Larissa sat down with the detectives for questioning. It didn't take long for them to find some pretty enormous holes in her story. Although she readily admitted that their divorce had been vicious, she tried to put on an air of concern for Tim's safety in front of the investigators. So according to her version of events, yes, she admitted she tried to contact him several times after hearing that he lost his job because she's so concerned. Come on. She even drove over to his house to see if he was there, she said. And after knocking on the door for a while and getting no response, she gave up. And she says she made no other attempts to get in touch with him. When asked where she was on the last day Tim was seen alive, she claimed that she was working all day and she ended up crashing on her couch when she got home. She told them that it looked like her phone had been dialed when she woke up, but the call wasn't intentional. Surely she must have rolled over and accidentally hit a button in her sleep or something. But that just, it didn't add up to the detectives. They asked if she happened to have her phone with her. And Larissa told them that she left it at home, but they found that pretty hard to believe. The only way her excuse could be remotely plausible was if Tim's number was programmed and pulled up. Otherwise, it was extremely unlikely that she just so happened to punch in his number and make the call like with her butt when she rolled over. So during a lull in the interview, the detective stepped out of the interrogation room and into the parking lot. The only car parked out front was her Lexus, and looking at it gave him a hunch. He glanced through the window and saw a cell phone sitting on the center console. He dialed her number, and the phone inside the car started ringing. So she didn't leave it at home after all. Instead, in an incredibly big brain stroke of genius, she left it right out in the open. Now, the detective returned to the interview and informed Larissa what he had discovered. He asked if she would mind getting the phone out of her car so he could verify whether or not Tim's number was actually, you know, pulled up, like in her favorites or something. She agreed, but there was a noticeable shift in her behavior. Her hands were visibly shaking as she walked back into the room, which only drew more attention to the fact that she seemed to be messing with the phone's contact list or settings. 
So to keep her from trying to cover her tracks, the detective asked if he could have a look for himself. As it turned out, none of the numbers in her favorites list were Tim's. And as the pressure mounted, Larissa asked for some water. Now, both detectives left the room, but they continued to watch her through the video feed from the security camera. Apparently, she didn't realize that being alone in an interrogation room doesn't necessarily mean you're not being watched. And it was painfully obvious that she was trying to change something on the phone while they weren't in the room to watch her do it. So when they walked back in, she had yet another excuse ready to go. This time she said that she'd accidentally entered Tim's number under their son's name. But wouldn't you know it, her shaky butterfingers hit the wrong button and just so happened to delete it right before they walked in. So naturally, the detectives weren't buying what she was trying to sell them. Eventually, she had no other choice but to come clean and admit she lied about the call. But she insisted that she was honest about everything else. The investigators decided to shelve that line of questioning for the moment and wrap things up soon afterward. The next morning, a friend of Larissa's came over to visit her at her house. Larissa was in full panic mode. She was nervous over the fact that the police had caught her in this pretty big lie and consumed with the fear that they might bug her phone or install a tracking device. Apparently, she was afraid that by doing so, they would learn that she was actually at the lab around 2 or 3 a.m. on the day that Tim went missing and not sleeping at home, as she previously claimed. Apparently, she was planning to take her son on vacation in a few days. They were going to Disney World, and she was operating under the mistaken assumption that the police couldn't serve a search warrant if she was out of town. The idea seemed to bring her some measure of comfort until her friend informed her that the police could conduct a warrant whether or not she was present. She also mentioned that they would most likely search her hard drives and could easily recover any data that had been deleted. Now, as this little tidbit of information started to sink in, Larissa's nervous behavior became frantic. She asked Tammy to stay with her son so she could go to the lab and pay some bills. And then she rushed out the door before her friend could really process just how strange she was acting. And the strangeness didn't stop there. While Larissa was gone, 24-year-old James Fagon happened to stop by her house. He walked right in without bothering to knock first, and he went straight upstairs. And then he hurried back down, and he left without a word. Her friend would later say that he looked really pale and sickly, and he had a pretty good reason for that, as it turned out. After all, he was the one that helped murder Tim Schuster. So back at the lab, Larissa once again enlisted Leslie's help. She told her she needed a truck big enough to haul a rototiller over to a friend's place. So Leslie rented a U-Haul. Again, she rented it in her own name. When Larissa came to pick up the rental, she seemed to be in a rush. Records from the nearby storage facility later showed that someone entering and leaving the unit Leslie had reserved at her boss's request. These records lined up with the time span in which Larissa had the moving truck in her possession. Now, about an hour later, Larissa called Leslie and asked her to meet her back at the U-Haul place. When she got there, she noticed Larissa was very thirsty and she was covered in dirt. There were scrapes on her chins. One of her shoes had blood on it. When she asked her what was going on, Larissa said she smashed her foot while she was loading the rototiller. When Leslie checked to see how many miles had been put on the truck, she got the feeling something wasn't quite right. The truck had only been driven 15 miles, which meant that it was physically impossible for Leslie to drive all the way to Clovis, where her friend supposedly lived, and back. So what was she really up to? On July 13th, Larissa and her son went to Disney World. While she was gone, the police turned their attention to a name that kept popping up in her call records her lab assistant, James. And once he was brought in for questioning, uh, it didn't take very long to get him to crack. According to his version of events, after helping Larissa break into Tim's condo back in August, she came back to him a while later and asked if he could help her do it again. Only this time, she wanted him to buy a stun gun and some zip ties to help get the job done right. Apparently, he was under the impression that they were just going to go back and get the rest of the property Tim had taken. But she told James that she was worried Tim would put up a fight, so it was going to be necessary to have a way to restrain him. 
Now, James claimed to have no knowledge of Larissa's true intentions when he agreed to the plan that she laid out for him. Late into the night on Thursday, July 9th, Larissa called and asked James to gather the things that she requested. When they were ready, they drove over to the condo. It was around 2 a.m. on Friday morning when they got there, and Larissa made that phone call she later tried so desperately to hide from the police. James would eventually testify that she told Tim their son was sick and needed him to come to the door. When he opened it, there was James, with the stun gun, ready to take him down. Then Larissa chloroformed him and tied a plastic bag over his head. Afterward, they bound his limbs together with the zip ties and drove him to her house to dispose of the remains. When they got there, he helped Larissa put Tim's body in the barrel and he doused it with bottle after bottle of hydrochloric acid. At one point, he admitted to the police that he wasn't entirely sure if Tim was even dead at this stage. He might have heard him breathing, he said, but he couldn't be sure. In an attempt to fact check what James was telling them, the investigators asked if he knew where the stun gun was. Apparently, he disposed of it by throwing it into a porta potty. As disgusting as the job of retrieving the weapon was, they found it right where their suspects said it would be, which led them to believe he was probably telling the truth about what happened. Now, somehow the fact that the authorities then had to sift through a giant pile of human waste wasn't even the most horrifying task they'd be given. The worst of it was still to come. Now, acid can cover up a lot of things, you see, but the smell of death just isn't one of them. All the Lysol and air freshener in the universe wouldn't mask the stench of what they would soon find. On July 14th, the day after Larissa left on vacation, Leslie found an envelope on her desk that simply said, thanks. There was a check for $510.25 inside. On the memo line, Larissa indicated the money was reimbursement for travel expenses, and that was really strange because she only owed Leslie about $40 for the cost of renting the truck. Leslie and Larissa's friend felt like they could no longer ignore their own suspicions. Larissa was just being way too weird. They both reached out to the police and told them everything they could. By the time evening rolled around, the detectives had three separate search warrants, one for Larissa's home, one for her lab, and one for her secret storage unit in Leslie's name. Now, the search of Larissa's lab turned up even more evidence. There was a can of Lysol sitting on top of a refrigerator, which was strange because they didn't use those kinds of cleaning products since they could contaminate the tests being performed. Now, six empty bottles of hydrochloric acid were also found in a dumpster out back. According to Leslie, the lab typically used no more than a single bottle in a year. Now, looking through Larissa's office computer turned up even more proof of her involvement in Tim's death, including searches for things like acid, digestion, tissues, animal tissues, sulfuric acid. Less than a week after Tim's murder, a warrant was issued for the arrests of Larissa Schuster and James Fagan. Oh, James wasn't very hard to find, but tracking Larissa down while she was on vacation took a little bit more work. By following her travel itinerary, however, they could plan the perfect moment to catch her off guard. Now, two days later, on July 16th, Larissa was arrested at the St. Louis airport. Among the items in her possession were two receipts from a store near both the lab and the storage facility showing purchases like Lysol and similar products. More damning, though, was a card she carried with instructions on how to enter the storage facility, along with the code to get into the unit. Now, the pair were tried separately. On November 27, 2006, James was the first to have his day in court. And to the surprise of absolutely nobody, he placed the blame for Tim's horrific murder squarely on Larissa's shoulders. According to his attorney, the road to perdition for Mr. Fagon begins with a sick, sadistic sociopath named Larissa Schuster. When James took the stand in his own defense, he said that he was terrified of Larissa and went along with her plan out of fear. Sure, he also admitted to accepting the $2,000 she offered for his assistance, but he claimed he only thought she wanted help with getting the rest of her stuff. Now, once the situation started going sideways, he was afraid that he would be next if he tried to back out last minute. 
Now, she said she had friends who were criminals, he told the jury. She had clout. She had money. She had friends in high places. She was involved with the Masons. Okay. She knew everybody. I was scared of her. Ultimately, it did little to sway the court in his favor. He was convicted of first-degree murder on December 12th, 2006, and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As for Larissa, her trial would kick off on October 22nd, 2007. And luckily for her, the prosecutors involved in the case decided against seeking the death penalty. Even better, the judge ruled that James' confession tapes were inadmissible because he was in the middle of an appeal and he refused to cooperate. So had the prosecutors managed to convince him to testify, they likely could have used the tapes. Unfortunately, though, they had nothing to offer him in return since he was already serving a mandatory life sentence. So as a result, the state's case against Larissa was built on a foundation of circumstantial evidence. But the good news was they had mountains of it. In his opening statement, the prosecutor explained how Larissa planned to kill her husband to prevent him from getting his share of their assets in the divorce, including 49% of the proceeds from her lab. A parade of employees and acquaintances took the stand to describe the many occasions where she raged about wanting him dead. At one point, her hairdresser testified that she simply believed her client was just, you know, struggling through a rough divorce and just venting. But as she kept getting more hateful, she remembered thinking, this is starting to get a little creepy. Yeah, you can say that again. Although James' interrogation wasn't allowed in the courtroom, almost two dozen of Larissa's threatening voicemails were. Now, the jury heard her screaming hate-filled messages like, you are such a wimp, you have no spine, I hope to God you burn in hell, and you will. In another message, she threatened, this is going to come back to haunt you. You just wait. It's coming, sweetheart. They also saw footage from her interrogation where she attempted to portray her husband as this angry, unpredictable man. Immediately after watching this footage, one of Tim's closest friends was called to the stand to describe the Tim Schuster he knew as a man that in no way resembled the picture Larissa was trying to paint of him. So once the prosecution finished making their case, it was time for the defense to refute it. Larissa's attorney insisted she was innocent. The murder, he claimed, was entirely James' idea, and she didn't even know what he'd done until after the fact. And yes, lying to the cops about her late night phone call was a bad decision, he admitted, but she was in shock and terrified that the police would think that she was involved. And those voicemails? Yeah, they were not a great look either, but she was just angry over the divorce that she filed for. That didn't mean she really wanted him to die, though. Of course not. But the question remained, why would James, her lab assistant, of all people, go out of his way to kill her estranged husband all on his own? According to the attorney, there was an answer for that, and it had nothing to do with the $2,000 Larissa had given him. No, He said James decided that he needed to murder Tim in cold blood out of this twisted sense of loyalty. That the two grand was just a payment for babysitting their son. The real reward was protecting Larissa from further being upset by her estranged husband. Now, Larissa actually took the stand in her defense. She did her best to explain away every piece of incriminating evidence. She maintained she had nothing to do with Tim's death. She didn't even know what happened until July 12th when James confessed to the murder. And when she asked why she didn't turn him in, like any reasonable person would, she told the court that she didn't want to ruin her family vacation. So instead, she helped him cover up his murder. In the end, the jury wasn't convinced. After two days of deliberation, the verdict came in on December 12, 2007. Guilty of first-degree murder with a special circumstance of financial gain. Larissa was sentenced to life in prison without parole on May 16, 2008. And you remember her daughter, Kristen? Well, Kristen was there in court to give an impact statement during the hearing. It had been five years since the two of them were in the same room. But Larissa's face was blank, even as Kristen poured her pain out in this scathing letter. She said to her, you've given up all rights as a mother, a wife, a daughter, a friend, and a woman. You're a disgrace to this family, a pitiful excuse for a human. I pray you're continually haunted at night by the sight and sound of my father fighting for his last moments on this earth. I hope you toss and turn and have horrible nightmares 
visualizing the horrific act of violence you have committed. Now, before she sat down, Kristen had one last thing to say to the woman that both gave her life and took her father's. Maybe later in life I can learn to forgive you, but I doubt it. This is goodbye, not just for now, but forever. This is goodbye as your daughter. And with that, she was taken to prison. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, I hope you'll do us the huge favor of giving this a like and hitting subscribe and the bell so you never miss a story. Chris and I are here every week. Until next time, take care.